Hello. The episode you're about to listen to is part of a multi-part series introducing an overview of Japanese history. This is a repeat of one of the original projects the History of Japan podcast was built on, and is intended to serve as an update and supplement to these original works. After 10 years, my hope is to return to this approach and to do it a little bit better given the skills that I have improved in the intervening years. If you haven't been doing so already, you should listen to these episodes sequentially, starting with episode 501. Without any further ado, enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to the History of Japan podcast, episode 520, The Age of Chaos. We're now 20 episodes into the revised introduction to Japanese history at what is probably roughly the halfway point, and of course already two episodes behind where I wanted to be, to the absolute astonishment of longtime listeners who know exactly how good I am at predicting how long things will take. And to be upfront, I had debated taking this episode to just advance our timeline, so to speak, but there are some important things left to say about the Sengoku period before we begin the process of leaving it behind. So I'm just going to curse myself by definitely saying this is the halfway point and there's no way I'm going to add more episodes later down the line, and that'll take us to a nice round 40, so it's symmetrical at least. And to be honest, I find this approach appealing because, well, up until this point, we've been focusing on the stories of great clans and daimyo in the Age of Warring States. Today is going to be all about the social and economic changes of the Age of Civil War. These are very important in their own right, and also kind of the perfect thing for the halfway mark, because many of these changes will be instrumental in shaping what comes next. You see, while people still use the classic three-part classical medieval modern schema derived from European history to periodize Japanese history, I've been using it myself in this very series, it's not quite as fashionable to do so as it once was. Instead, in academia, that schema has largely been replaced by a two-part one, pre-modern and modern, with the divide coming more or less around 1600 at the end of the Sengoku period. Many of the institutions which will shape modern Japanese history, or at least early modern Japanese history, are created by the specific circumstances of the age of civil war, so setting them up at the halfway mark feels nicely symmetrical, for lack of a better word. So with that said, what's so different about the Sengoku period? And here I think we have to start with the economy because, well, money, as they say, makes the world go round. It's also a natural jumping-on point from what we've been talking about recently because it was the rise of the daimyo, the territorial warlords of the Sengoku period, that really enabled some of the biggest economic changes of the time. You see, the earlier shugo of the Ashkaga years had ruled over provinces that were in many ways a patchwork. You of course had the Frankensteining of the shugo system on top of the existing structure of civilian government dating back to the Nara years, as well as the province itself inevitably being divided into a patchwork of different show-in tax-free estates, each with its own history and customs in relationship with proprietors who manage their show-in very differently. And all this could make life very annoying, to say the least, for an enterprising businessman of the provinces. If, say, two villages were right next to each other, the natural thing would be for them to trade, right? But if they're in two different shōen, or even if one isn't a shōen and the other is kokugaryo, the land belonging to the state, that creates an extra legal headache because now you have to figure out who gets a cut of the transaction, depending on the local rules. Honestly, the whole thing resembles, at least to me, nothing so much as pre-revolutionary France, where the monarchy ruled over a patchwork of different fiefdoms and church land holdings and other divisions that overlapped and bumped up against each other in ways that didn't really fit with how people lived day to day. And just like how the revolution started the process of burning down that whole system to create something more reflective of reality, the Sengoku era burned this whole patchwork down to the ground. In the aftermath, the daimyo, especially the successful ones who became major political players, worked very hard to centralize their control over their lands, 
rather than allowing for this sort of patchwork approach. They would invest in land surveys to more efficiently tax the land they control, but also helped pay for adoption of new techniques in farming or mining to make those lands more productive. They would often regulate the movement of goods out of their territories. Daimyo in the interior, whose lands contained iron deposits, often prevented the export of iron out of their domains, because the ore could literally be made into weapons their rivals could use against them. For that same reason, coastal daimyo, whose people say could produce salt from seawater, often restricted the salt trade, salt being not just flavoring, but a crucial preservative necessary for things like, say, creating rations for soldiers on the march, or just feeding your own population through a famine. If your neighbor's peasants all starve, of course, conquering their lands is going to be a lot easier. But within their domains, which, unlike a lot of old shoen, were actually territorially contiguous and more reflective of the actual geography of the region, the daimyo encouraged trade, since prosperity benefited them directly. The broad masses were also not passive actors in all of this. Their role is, of course, less well documented, as we've already covered literacy outside of the elite was rare during this time, but they do still appear in sources created by the literate, and these, plus archaeological evidence, have revealed what can only be called a pretty spectacular level of economic growth during the age of civil war. A big driving force in this shift was coinage. After all, currency is pretty handy for facilitating trade, as those of you who've gone to a supermarket any time recently and haven't had to bring a whole cow or a giant stack of grain or whatever to trade with the cashier are doubtless aware. The coinage of the age, however, was not domestic. Previous attempts to mint currency in Japan had not been successful, with the most recent as of the Sengoku period being the administration of Emperor Go Daigo, who announced plans to begin minting coins, but never got around to it before getting the boot from Ashikaga Takauji. Instead, coins were imported en masse from China, it being easier to use Chinese coins which were made of precious metal and were of standardized weights, and therefore held their value, than minting your own currency. Specifically, coins from the old Song Dynasty and the then-current Ming Dynasty were brought to Japan in massive amounts. The dynasty in between, the Mongol-ruled Yuan, actually used paper currency rather than coinage, and that distinctly does not hold its value once the government backing it goes down. Coinage imports were a big part of the reason why Ashikaga Yoshimitsu and his successors accepted nominal subordination to China's emperors, a requirement for trade, and most of the trade ships coming back to Japan from China were filled not with porcelain or silk or other goods like that, though there certainly was some of that too, but with literal giant piles of cash, the cash itself being a great saleable commodity. This was of course not super popular with the government of the Ming Dynasty, Part of the reason for the eventual shutdown of the Japan trade beyond the tendency of Japanese delegations to get into fights in Chinese territory was the sheer volume of coinage being shipped out of the country. But the ban didn't stop trade either. Unofficial trade, or to use the language of the Ming Dynasty, piracy, continued apace, often backed financially by leading figures of the Ming Dynasty who could invest in these pirate schemes and make a killing, because the coinage being contraband also made whatever did make it to Japan incredibly valuable. You are, if you are one of these officials, both creating and then exploiting a black market for Chinese currency. Truly the act of a gentleman who deeply understands the virtues of Confucius. Anyway, the mass import of coinage also enabled the continued growth of a commercial economy in the provinces, something we've talked about in previous episodes because it did begin during the medieval years. But by the Sengoku era, that commercialization had stepped up massively, assisted and encouraged by the regional daimyo, who now had a reason to want commercialization because, after all, they could tax it. Still, while in this case the interests of those living in the provinces and their warrior class overlords overlapped, that wasn't always the case, and indeed one of the most fascinating and distinctive features of this period emerged from circumstances where the two were very much at odds. When we think about power, it's clearly a nebulous concept. Power can come from many different places. The military power of the daimyo, who could call on armies of loyal samurai to fight for them, was one such. However, there are other forms of power. 
For example, you have the wealthy Buddhist temples in the provinces which had their own lands and armies, rich merchants who were influential in a market town, or alliances of village headmen across a region. And one of the fascinating things you see during this period is some of these very groups organizing among themselves against the power of the samurai class, forming the so-called ikki. It's a term that's very hard to translate. It might be accurately rendered as something like self-governing league. These self-governing leagues are hard to talk about for the simple fact that they are quite varied between themselves. Some were provincial affairs more concerned with protection against what they saw as exploitation by powerful daimyo. One such kuniiki, or provincial rising, formed in Yamashiro right next to Kyoto in the late 1400s. Others were religious movements led by major sects. The largest iki, the Iko iki, was associated with Jodo Shinshu, the true Pure Land sect founded by Shinran back in the 1200s. Broadly, the one thing all the Iki had in common was representing a form of opposition to rule by elite warriors, led by cross-class alliances. A local Iki would often have the support of wealthy peasants, merchants, the lower ranks of the samurai class, and in the case of religious Iki, Buddhist temples, though the relationship between temples and their Iki movements was complicated and a subject of some historical dispute today. Now there's no way in hell I'm going to do justice to the Iki as a concept here, but I want to touch on them because they're important for a few reasons. First and foremost, when we talk about the story of reunification starting in the next episode, the defeat of the Iki, especially of the religious ones with powerful temples backing them, will be a subject of some importance for us, so it's worth bringing up here. Second, and somewhat relatedly, some of these Iki became extremely powerful. Admittedly, not all of them. The Yamashiro Iki I just mentioned was crushed by forces of the Ashikaga Shogunate, which did still control Kyoto and the surrounding area, in the 1490s. But the Iko Iki of the Jodo Shinshu, for example, became absolutely massive. At one point, forces associated with it controlled about one-third of Japan's landmass, mostly in the center of the country, the most wealthy and developed part. So this was not some minor provincial dust-up by any means. Third, the Iki were in many ways enabled by the very subject we were just discussing, the growth of the commercial economy. Iki often coalesced around market towns in the provinces, which were in turn often next to Buddhist temples and Shinto shrines. As we've discussed in past episodes, that meant the markets were already next to tourist destinations, and they could rely on the religious institutions for protection, not to mention the spiritual power of the religious site itself. For example, what became the most central site of the Ikoiki, Higashiyama Honganji, was a temple in the center of what's now Osaka, more or less the site of Osaka Castle today, which got to be the size that it was because it was at the center of several trade networks. And Higashiyama Honganji is the most prominent example, but not the only one. Lastly, the Iki are interesting, at least to me, because of the alternative path they represent. Speaking personally, the Iki resemble nothing so much as the early democracies and republics of modern Europe. Like, for example, the free cities of the Holy Roman Empire, they were often dominated by what we could almost call a middle class, educated monks, lower to mid-level samurai, merchants who could afford an education, peasant landholders. They weren't democratic in the sense we'd recognize today, they did not extend political agency to everyone but certainly more so than the autocratic governments of the daimyo. Of course, unlike Europe, the Iki lost, but it's interesting to imagine what could have been. Anyway, the Iki also bring us to the subject of religion, and that's the next place I want to turn our attention to. By the 1500s, the strands of popular Buddhism we talked about a few episodes back had genuinely taken that religion to the masses. I think it's fair to call Japan a predominantly Buddhist country by the Sengoku period. That's not to say that Japanese traditional religion, Shinto, though that term is a bit anachronistic here, had vanished by any means. However, outside of the major shrines associated with the imperial family and with the temple lands to support them, most Shinto institutions were small ones with limited influence. And Shinto, after all, is a hard religion to proselytize for. Unlike Buddhism, there is no defined theology you can point to to argue a case for it, or even, at this point, anything approaching a unified doctrine between shrines. 
You see the first attempts to create a more unified Shinto belief system during this period, spearheaded by something we call Yoshida Shinto. That name comes from Yoshida Kanetomo, a Kyoto aristocrat and Shinto priest in the early 1400s, who spent his life crafting a vision of Shinto as a distinct religion from Buddhism. Up until this point in Japanese history, as Yoshida himself noted, the two religions had grown together. He himself described most Shinto teachings as falling into one of two categories. The first was Honjaku Engi, the origin of the avatars, a reference to the Honji Suijaku theories we discussed early in the series. This is the notion that the Shinto pantheon are manifestations of Buddhist deities in a Japanese context, for example, the sun goddess Amaterasu being an avatar of Avalokiteshvara or Kanon, the Bodhisattva of Mercy. The second category was Ryobu Shugo, roughly a combination of the twofold mandalas. Essentially, it's a similar teaching that described how the characteristics of Shinto gods were reflections of Buddhist virtues. Yoshida advocated for a third form of Shinto instead, Yuyitsu Shinto, which very humbly translates as the one and only Shinto. This would allow practitioners to find the divine in themselves. They do this by a series of esoteric rituals designed to connect them to the gods directly, an approach that's not really anti-Buddhist, but decidedly non-Buddhist. The goal here was not to focus on Buddhist virtues of non-materialism or what have you, but instead on esotericism designed to shortcut directly to the divine, so to speak. Yoshida hoped, in short, to offer a path to salvation that was decidedly non-Buddhist. Yoshida's descendants would continue to preach his ideas, and his followers became known as the Yoshida School. They would be more influential in later centuries, eventually pressuring the government into giving them the ability to license shrines as official Yoshida schools, which came with certain legal and tax benefits. But the Yoshida school would never be fully accepted, nor was membership in the Yoshida program, so to speak, mandatory, just as many resisted it as accepted it. Far more influential in this period was a new religion arriving in Japan for the first time, Christianity. Christianity, or to be specific Roman Catholicism, came to Japan in 1543 with the advent of a new player on the political stage, the Portuguese. Portuguese vessels had been coming to Asia for decades at this point. The explorer Vasco da Gama arrived in Goa in India in 1498, and Jorge Alvarez made it to the Ming Dynasty China in 1513. In turn, the first Portuguese to reach Japan were merchantmen engaged in coastal trade around China, who were blown off course by a storm and arrived by accident at Tanegashima, just off the southern coast of Kyushu. They might have come by accident, but quickly the Portuguese realized there was great profit to be made in Japan. For one thing, these Europeans brought with them fun newfangled weapons like the arquebus and early cannon, just the sort of thing for a hot young warlord looking to make, say, an explosive impression on his neighbors and rivals. Of course, guns had other uses beyond making cheap puns in a language nobody involved in this moment spoke, most notably, they're a lot easier to learn how to use than a bow and arrow, and many daimyo during this period relied on conscripts to fill out their armies of warriors, conscripts who could much more easily be taught to shoot someone with an arquebus than they could be taught to shoot someone with a bow and arrow. As a trade good, though, guns have one big issue, they are pretty easy to reverse engineer, and that is precisely what happened. It wasn't long at all before native gunsmiths took up the trade themselves, cutting out the need for Portuguese suppliers. Still, the Portuguese did have other ways to make a buck in Japan. One of the biggest money makers, the one that doesn't tend to get much attention, was the slave trade, because yes, Japan, like pretty much the rest of the world, did have a slave trade for most of its history. The daimyo of Kyushu, like everywhere else, took slaves as a part of their looting after victory, and while there was a domestic trade, the Portuguese would also buy Japanese slaves for a substantial amount shipping them around Portugal's already world-spanning maritime empire. For that reason, after the Age of Civil War, the slave trade was actually banned, not out of humanitarian concern, but because of the belief that Japanese people being sold as slaves in other parts of the world reflected badly on Japan as a collective whole. The other big moneymaker was the China trade. 
the Portuguese did have permission to trade in China out of their rented territory in Macau, which was not returned to Chinese sovereignty actually until 1999. And remember, while smuggling between China and Japan did happen, there's always risks with that sort of thing. But the Portuguese could buy in China legally and also get to Japanese ports, and I imagine the first Portuguese captain to figure this out had a literal cartoon moment where their eyes turned into dollar signs thinking about the piles of money they would make. And piles of money was exactly what they did make. Pretty much every daimyo with a port big enough to take a Portuguese carrick was tripping over themselves inviting the Portuguese to come by and trade, which is probably also why said daimyo were, at first, willing to tolerate the strange men who started accompanying these Portuguese merchants, talking about some sort of one true god who's also three different gods somehow. Look, don't ask the Jew to explain Trinitarianism, guys. This was pretty much how Christianity found its foothold in Japan. The first missionaries to come to the country, all from the newly founded Jesuit Order of the Roman Catholic Church, arrived in the late 1540s by hitching rides along with merchants. In turn, the Jesuits began to make local daimyo an offer in the ports they visited. Being priests, they had sway over the Portuguese merchants, who were, after all, good Catholic believers who would listen to the words of a man of God. So if the priests were to, say, encourage their merchant brethren to frequent a specific port in Japan because the locals were led by a good, kind daimyo who was friendly to the Christian faith, well, that would be what you call a win-win. More than a few daimyo were happy to take them up on this offer, which essentially, let's be realistic, was a bribe, and before long, more than a few daimyo were even willing to convert to the new faith to curry favor with the priests and, by extension, the merchants. This was not without problems of its own, of course. The priests became infamous for, for example, encouraging Japanese converts to demonstrate the sincerity of their new beliefs by attacking Buddhist places of worship which were, read through the eyes of a strict monotheism, a form of devil worship designed to mislead people with false teachings. The first daimyo in Japan to convert to Christianity, Omura Sumitada, even triggered a civil war within his own domain by following the instructions of his Jesuit teachers to destroy his father's Buddhist memorial tablet, which was, of course, an icon of a false religion. Destroying it, however, did not make Omura's non-Christian samurai particularly pleased, to put it mildly, he was nearly overthrown in the ensuing war. Still, despite these early setbacks, by the 1590s Christianity had thousands of believers around Japan. By 1600, there were an estimated 300,000 converts in a country of approximately 22 million. Which isn't a huge number, it's a bit over 0.01% of the population, but given that all this happened in only 57 years, it's still quite an accomplishment. And the raw numbers don't give the whole story because the Christian population was also concentrated in one area, Kyushu, the point closest to China's mainland and the site of the first Portuguese arrivals in the region. This was also far and away the most Christian part of the country, with the faith being centered on the trade port given to the Jesuits by Omura Sumitada after his conversion, Nagasaki. Of course, not long after this moment, the Christian faith would encounter, to put it mildly, one hell of a reversal of fortunes, but that's a story for another time, once we've introduced the people who will deal Japanese Christianity a nearly fatal series of blows. Now, there's one more thing I want to touch on as a part of this episode, and it might seem odd for an episode about a period of civil war, but interestingly, this is also a time of cultural flourishing. And here I'm realizing we do need to briefly backtrack to a discussion of economics, because one of the realities of art across human history is that while we often like to think of art being made for its own sake, art is often influenced by and reflective of the priorities of those who have a lot of cash on hand. You see, as the economy commercialized during this period, the great daimyo of Japan were forced to shift their own bases of power to accommodate it. In previous eras, samurai families had generally been based out of fortified manors located in defensible parts of their territory, this being natural enough in a time and age where, as we've seen, political instability was a problem, to put it mildly. But the thing was, during the age of civil wars in particular, the daimyo who succeeded tended to be the ones who could control wealth and trade, the better to get their own hands on a piece of the action and use it to pay for all those swords and guns and spears 
and also food, rations, and medicine, and other less exciting but equally important things. To do that, daimyo had to move out of the mountainous, defensible interior and to the places where trade was actually happening, usually coastal or river towns or markets along major roadways. Basically, it's more efficient to administrate trade if you're administering it from the places it's happening. And this is the genesis of the so-called Jokamachi, or Castle Town. Particularly by the later years of the Sengoku, these castle towns became bastions of daimyo power, allowing daimyo to maintain their control over trade in their land and also project power and authority, symbolically by building a giant fortress in the middle of a market town, and practically because said fortresses allowed them to control that market town and also nearby ports, road junctions, and so on. Many of Japan's major cities today grew out of these castle towns from this very period, or from older market towns that became castle towns once the local daimyo rolled in and plopped down a fortress. Edo, now the modern city of Tokyo, is of course the most famous example, but there are many others, from Hagi to Kokura to Sendai, a city founded by Date Masamune, one of our subjects from last week, to be a center of trade and commerce in northern Japan, one that he of course could personally control, and thus sample a little of the action from. All of this is of course very important in terms of talking about the increasing urbanization of the period, though that's relative, the population remained overwhelmingly rural, but why, you might be wondering, does any of this matter for the realm of culture? Well, think of it this way. These new castle towns create, to put it rather simply, a captive market. Now you have a bunch of merchants living in the castle towns, of course the daimyo themselves and their warriors who are keeping order in the cities, and their administrators who handled the actual running and, more importantly, the taxing of the town. All of these people are drawn to the cities by economic necessity, but once they are there, well, they'll find themselves in search of something profoundly different. Entertainment. They need things to do. Now, I do have to admit to something here, and it might offend some of the more artistic purists, for lack of a better word, who are out there, but I'm very much a believer in the idea that art is best understood as a product of financial and cultural incentive combined with existing taste. Art is best understood in relation to economic demand for it, and how that demand relates to ideas of power and prestige, as expressed in artistic patronage by the wealthy. Which perhaps is a very culturally insensitive, déclassé, and philistine take on my part, but hey, I never claim to be a man of refined taste. Anyway, this is why, for my money, the expansion of the castle towns and the commercialization of the economy is important in relation to the history of art and aesthetics, because suddenly, you have a lot more people with both the time and the money to care about those things, and they're conveniently in one place. As for the art they were appreciating, much of it was a continuation of what had been artistically popular in the later decades of Ashkaga rule. In particular, while Kyoto was no longer the political center of the country, and while it was badly damaged by the Onin War, it remained the cultural heart of Japan, both because of its large population of literate aristocrats, and because the Kyoto area still was the most developed part of Japan. And that meant that Kyoto tastes shaped what was popular, in particular, the tastes of Ashikaga Yoshimasa. Yoshimasa was the shogun who oversaw Japan's descent into the Onin War, and while he was an atrocious politician, he was, as we also mentioned at the time we brought him up at first, a very dedicated patron of the arts. So dedicated, in fact, that much of the aesthetics of the time were shaped by his taste. For example, he was central to the career of a man named Zayami, a playwright and actor who, with Ashikaga Yoshimasa's money, would put together what became one of Japan's most famous forms of classical theater, no. He was also a patron of painting, specifically the suiboku or ink wash style. Those are the monochrome paintings with black ink. They're very striking to see. He was, like any good aristocrat, fond of poetry and particularly fond of the waka form, hosting competitions in the style of earlier generations, and even his architectural tastes are important. His retirement complex at Ginkakuji represented a big break from older styles of building, moving away from heavy wooden construction to a lighter approach dominated by sliding shoji paper screens, by what we now think of as a more traditional architectural aesthetic. 
These tastes were informed by Yoshimasa's personal predilections, of course, and those in turn were informed by a sort of fashionable notion of religion, derived from the Rinzai sect of Zen, which was very much the religion of the elite during this time. That relationship with Zen wasn't really about belief. Yoshimasa himself was not even a particularly ardent follower of Zen, and appears to have been more of a Pure Land believer than anything else. But his aesthetics were very much informed by Zen ideas because, again, Zen was the expected religion of the Kyoto elite. It was fashionable, and had been ever since the elite warriors of the earlier Kamakura shogunate had adopted it. And so, expressing Zen ideas about even the most humble things having a Buddha nature or the transience and impermanence of the world and the like through art was very much in vogue, and Yoshimasa did have one hell of an eye for that sort of thing, just not, you know, for running a country. As a result of Yoshimasa's patronage, by the height of the civil wars, Kyoto was home to a flourishing population of artists, connected to schools and masters patronized by Yoshimasa, and Kyoto being the ancient capital, the height of culture, all that stuff, their approaches were imitated by artists in the provinces. So why does that matter? Because it's during this period that the groundwork gets laid for the artistic explosion of the next era of Japanese history we're going to look at, and a lot of the styles and approaches associated with that period are grounded in this one. In other words, much of what you might think of when you think of traditional Japanese art and aesthetics is finding its footing in this time, thanks to the commercialization of the economy and the growth of the castle towns. The real boom is not yet upon us, but the groundwork is being laid, so to speak. So why does all of this matter when we're talking about a period of civil war? Why dedicate an entire episode to things that are, at best, tangentially related to the war itself? Well, because I think it's important for us to keep in mind that this period is not just about armed conflict. That's not to say the wars don't matter, of course, but we do ourselves a disservice in terms of understanding the Sengoku period if we focus just on the death and destruction and violence, though, again, there's plenty of that to go around. Just as important as the fact that all that war swept the proverbial board clean, burned down institutions and establishments which had existed for centuries to clear the way for something new, is that the Age of War and Chaos was also when the seeds of that very something new got planted. The Age of War was, for some, also an age of opportunity. I think we will see that even more clearly next time, when we look at the stories of three men who, I think it's fair to say, seized the opportunities before them better than anyone else in their time, or possibly any time. Next week, we're going to start a look at Japan's three unifiers, who would bring an end to the Age of Civil War and usher in a new government, which didn't just empower samurai, but made them by far the most dominant force in national politics. In doing so, they would usher in the longest Age of Peace in Japanese history. But that's for the future. That's all for this week. Thank you very much for listening. Before we get into our outro, just a quick heads up, there will be no new episode next week as I am traveling out of the country for a family obligation, so I'll see you all in two weeks' time. This show is a part of the Facing Backward podcast network. You can find out more about this show on our other shows at facingbackward.com, and you can support the network at patreon.com slash facingbackward. Special thanks to those who have given at our shout-out tier, Yan Leonard, Stephen Elkins, Martin Oliveira, Clark Canning, Ian Kellett, Matt Haynes, Jackie Frostalker, Monkey Sack, Alayla McCulloch, Karen Murphy, Peter Wales, Robert Prine, William Arno, Jonas Brandis, Nicholas Kroll, Jerry Spinrad, Jared Stevens, Jeffrey Dwork, Stefan Hrushka, Joshua Kane, Robbie and Cat, Jacob Key, Aaron Finkbeiner, and Anonymous Anna's Hummingbird, Mark Sy, Gil, Leslie Ikuta, Trash Taste Enjoyer, John, Christopher, Harrison Reese, Inoue Enrio's Ghostbusters, Nihongokaizen.com, Shimao Toshio's History of Japanesia podcast, A House is a Perfectly Cromulent Mascot, The Fish I Catch R Road Scholars Compared to Samuel Alito, Schmuck, and Everything Changed When the Fire Nation Attacked. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next time for the start of reunification. <laughs>